Well, good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us once again at the MacArthur Memorial. Uh, tonight, as usual, we have another really powerful uh, presentation, and tonight it is Tower of Skulls, Rich Frank. Now, as we are in America, we kind of get Eurocentric with World War II, and we look at the Pacific as basically from Pearl Harbor to the dropping of the atomic bombs and the end of the war with Japan. Uh, the land war in Asia is really something that's been neglected in our scholarship, um, basically because uh, we didn't know so much about it. And in the past 15 years, a lot has come out in the Chinese archives, as well as throughout Japan, that Richard Frank has been able to access. And so now we have this first book in his trilogy about the Asia Pacific War. They call Korea the Forgotten War, but really that land war in Asia between China and Japan is the Forgotten War. Really, it's the unknown war. And I think this book and Richard Frank's scholarship is going to go a long way to rectifying that situation. We're very glad to have Richard Frank here with us again tonight. Uh, uh, I can only promise you this is going to be uh, another power-packed uh, event. And so let's get right on with it, and we'll see you for the live question and answer period afterward. It's a great pleasure to be here at the MacArthur Memorial Museum. Uh, you know, I've been to research facilities literally all over the globe, and this is absolutely a first-rate place to go. I cannot too highly recommend uh, how wonderful the assistance is here and how comprehensive the holdings are here. I certainly spent a lot of time here working on this first volume and on the subsequent volumes. So let me talk about what is the first volume of a trilogy called the Asia Pacific War. Now, World War II is the greatest event and some would say the greatest story in human history. It's an episode in history which literally girdled the entire uh, globe at that time. It touched um, directly or indirectly virtually the entirety of the world's population, which was like 2.3 billion people at that time, and its effects have cascaded down literally to this very day. One of the most obvious and conspicuous ones is that the People's Republic of China, according to no less authority than Mao Zedong, would not have existed were it not for Japan's aggression in China in 1937. Now, we have had over the decades sort of a standard narrative of the Second World War. And in that standard narrative, we say that World War II began when Hitler invaded Poland in September 1939. And then we have that, that other part of World War II, which we conventionally call the Pacific War. And that began on December 7th, 1941, with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. What I'm doing with this trilogy, however, is attempt to create effectively a new master narrative of this other part of World War II, calling it the Asia Pacific War. And the reason why I do this is because that, that Pacific War narrative effectively leads out, leads, leaves out this enormous part of the war. This is the war that took place in what I call the Arc of Asia. In 1937, that arc ran from India, which at that time included Pakistan and Bangladesh, east across Burma, China, and Japan to the Western Pacific, and southeast to what is now Indonesia. And within that arc of Asia, there lived over a billion people, or literally about half the population of the world at that time. Yet, within that entire span at that time, there were only four nation states with some claim of sovereignty. Uh, two of these were uh, what was then Siam, which very shortly became Thailand, and the other was Japan, which had real sovereignty. They definitely controlled their own destiny. Then you had Mongolia, which was effectively a Soviet client state, which had no, no real sovereignty. And then of course you had China, which in 1937 had highly compromised sovereignty with many erosions that had been carved into Chinese sovereignty over uh, about a uh, century up to that point. And we had one special case, which is particularly significant for the MacArthur Memorial and Museum, and that's the Philippines. The Philippines were effectively, it had been an American colony, but in 19, 34, the U.S. Congress uh, passed and President Roosevelt signed legislation that guaranteed the Philippines independence after a 10-year period of uh, basically home rule. Uh, and that 
was in process at the time, and of course would play a huge role in the attitude of most Filipinos to uh, Japan's uh, occupation of the Philippines. Now, that arc of Asia today, as you can see in this uh, slide, now contains at least 19, and depending on how you count it, 20 or 21 sovereign nations in that exact same region. And the path of virtually every one of those nations to where they are today is fundamentally connected and shaped by the Asia Pacific War, although sometimes in, in very uh, strange ways that the war impacted how the outcome uh, for that particular nation and those peoples uh, actually was. So once again, in the long-term arc of this narrative, that is one of the most important themes, is how this war between 1937 and 1945 shaped the 21st century that we live in today. Now, beyond the issue of uh, this arc of Asia, there's one other very important metric about the Asia Pacific War, and that is the total number of deaths. Now, no one can say with absolute certainty how many people died in the Second World War. The conventional and widely accepted number now is about 60 million, with much of the literature arguing to nudge that number up perhaps to as many as 70 million. Now, I use standard academic sources in the work of a lot of historians that I respect in, the, in specific areas, uh, like John Dower or Werner uh, Gruel. And I think that uh, a reasonable and probably very conservative estimate is the Asia Pacific War resulted in the deaths of about 25 million human beings. And of that number, only about 6 million combatants, soldiers, sailors, or airmen, including uh, about uh, 3 million Chinese and about 2 million Japanese, and then to balance all others, including a lot of Asians who were serving in uh, Japan's uh, imperial uh, episode, uh, outreach. Now, that immediately tells you by math alone that there were 19 million non-combatant deaths. And using very generous estimations, you can get Japanese non-combatant deaths up to perhaps a million or maybe 1.2 million. And I think that that's really at the outside. And that really tells you immediately that uh, somewhere between 17 and 17.8 million non-combatants died who were not Japanese. They were overwhelmingly other Asians. Only a minuscule number of them would be people we now classify as white. About 12 million of them or Chinese. And if you take the 12 million Chinese non-combatant deaths and you factor in this almost exactly 3,000 days that China fought between 37 and 45, you get the astonishing number that literally 4,000 Chinese were dying every single day the war went on. If you take the other parts of Asia, which became involved after December 1941, uh, which uh, ran about 1,300 days or so, and you use that about 5.8 or 6 million figure for deaths in that area, you get over 4,000 a day. So on a linear basis by 1945, there were 8,000 non-combatants who were not Japanese who were dying every single day of the war, every day, every hour, every month, however you want to count it. It's a simply astonishing figure. And that also is one of the major aspects about this work is to have us remember these people. Further, if you simply try to work out how many of these people died in what we conventionally call the Pacific War, it's only about 15% of the total number of deaths. So essentially, an important part of this narrative is to talk about the fate of a billion people, uh, most of whom have not been addressed or have been addressed very lightly in other literature, and the fact that they sustained about 85% of the deaths in the entire Asia Pacific War. Now, the trilogy has four basic features to it. I'm going to outline it at this point. And these uh, figures, uh, actually, these basic foundational points are, are as follows. The first is that although I've done a tremendous amount of original research and archives all over the world, and I've built upon literally decades of work as a historian or whatever here, I would say that the dominant feature of this trilogy is synthesis because I've reached out to a wonderful network of uh, colleagues, great historians all over the world who've been uh, instrumental in helping me. I've also had the enormous benefit of additional archival information, particularly with respect to China, uh, 
in this period, which simply was not available until 15 or 20 years ago. You couldn't have done this and done justice for China earlier than uh, say 15 or 20 years ago or begun to do justice to China in that period. Uh, now, the second thing is, as I indicated, what I'm trying to do with this narrative is to integrate that Pacific War, Asia Pacific, into an Asia Pacific War, incorporating all these ev uh, events in the arc of Asia. And I've told all my colleagues that this is the first narrative in any language that's attempted in one coherent narrative to tell this whole story, which I think sets this trilogy apart from anything that's gone before. Now, the third thing that sets this apart, and I think is illustrated by a, a wonderful story that I came across. Uh, Joseph C. Grew was the U.S. ambassador to Japan in uh, basically for about a bit, almost a decade before Pearl Harbor. And Grew, as a young boy, had gone to school with a fellow named Franklin D. Roosevelt, who by 1933 was the U.S. president. And as far as I know, Joseph Grew is the only government official who addressed correspondence to the president of the United States, Dear Frank. So in December 1940, Grew writes directly to President Roosevelt and says, you know, I, I'd like some guidance, Mr. President, as to how you, you, you know, want me to conduct relations between the U.S. and Japan. And Roosevelt writes back, and in this one single wonderful sentence, I think he captures something that's really fundamental. And that is, he writes, I believe that the fundamental proposition that we must recognize is that hostilities in Europe, in Africa, and in Asia are all parts of a single world conflict. That's the end of that quote. And that really helped inspire me to bear in mind throughout doing all my work to keep looking at not only what's happening in the Asia Pacific region, but how it relates or does not relate to what's going on in Europe. And that's led to some of the, I think, some of the most important facets about this book. Now, the fourth feature is this. Uh, military events between 37 and 1945 form the, the basic skeleton of the work because they provide a, a chronological um, marching order for discussing this. But the trilogy is in explicitly intended not simply to be a recitation of sort of military events. It strives also to incorporate into that narrative the very important economic, uh, political, and social impact of that war, which is, as I will try to illustrate to you, is absolutely enormous in terms of not only what happened then, but the world we live in today. Now, Having set forth sort of all that preamble, let me now take you into uh, a little discussion about uh, aspects about this first volume. And I start here as the war started, as, uh, as I presented, in China and the events in China from 1937 to 1938. Now, uh, here's a map of what I call China the Fractured State, which is where China was in July 1937, when an episode called the Marco Polo Bridge Incident is going to trigger the sustained war between Japan and China. And what's striking about this is that you'll notice that Japan had occupied Manchuria in 1931, 1932. They'd also come to dominate some provinces down towards the Great Wall. The rest of China was this gigantic mosaic of local and regional power brokers. And among those, the most powerful and most dominant was the Nationalist Party, headed by a gentleman we call General Lixin of Shanghai Shek. And they controlled seven of China's 30 provinces, basically in the lower Yangtze Valley. These were both the most economically advanced and the most populous provinces of China at that time, with a population of about 170 million people, which is somewhat over a third of the total Chinese population, though, at that time of about 450 million people. Now, uh, for decades, we've had this sort of narrative, at least this indication, that in 1937, uh, the areas outside of Japanese control were already in a full, full tilt civil war, with the two sides being on the one side, Chiang Kai-shek and the Nationalists, and on the other side, Mao Zedong and the Chinese Communists. And we now know from the evidence we have is that this is not remotely true. Uh, China was this incredible mosaic of all these regional and local power brokers, as I indicated. And in 1937, Mao and the Chinese Communist Party had very recently come off what they called the Great March, 
in their ritual base area in South Central China. And they settled into what is by even Chinese standards, an extremely impoverished area, impoverished area in Northwestern China. And at that time, the area under Mao's control totaled about 1.45 million people. Now this was not 3% of Chinese population. This was 3 tenths of 1% of China's population at that time. And this gets to one of the really long-term made marks of the whole trilogy. I mean, it was just astonishing, incredible to think that in 1937, starting from that incredibly low ebb, by 12 years later in 1949, Mao and the Chinese communists are going to uh, control what's going to become the People's Republic of China. And that story will play out through all three volumes. And in this first volume, it's important to remember this incredibly low starting point for the Chinese uh, uh, communists at the beginning of the Asia Pacific War. Now, uh, we also know from particularly the recent scholarship that a lot of mythology about Zhang Kai-shek simply is not true. And one of the most uh, important parts of what I think is this mythology is that he never really wanted to uh, engage the Japanese. He was always looking to a showdown battle with the Chinese communists and was biding his time for that. Well, we've had this outpouring of evidence now uh, from both sides of the Taiwan Straits. A lot of historians, in fact, in the uh, People's Republic of China now would agree with what I'm about to say. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that Chiang Kai-shek's diaries became public about 2007. And as one uh, PRC historian pointed out, this totally changed the picture. What becomes really clear when you look at those diaries, now a bunch of other archival evidence we have, is that after Japan occupied Manchuria, as I indicated in 31, 32, Shang recognized that in order to restore China's sovereignty, to make China again a great nation, there was going to have to be this showdown battle with Japan. But unlike many of his critics, who kept uh, insisting that he start that war immediately, Shang appreciated what a tremendous colossal undertaking was going to be for China and the state it was in to take on the modern nation state of Japan. But we have records now showing extensive preparation, planning of how this war was going to be fought that Shang was spearheading at that time. So it's very clear that getting to war in 1937 was not something that others had to thrust upon Shang. It was in fact, uh, a moment when he decided that he'd abided and asked for the patience of the people he had to have respect of for as long as he possibly could. And then in 1937, it was now time to have a showdown battle with Japan. Now, in looking at that, the, the Marco Polo Bridge incident takes place outside of Beijing, which is to say up in more northern China. And Zhang looked at the situation and decided that fighting in northern China would be folly for the Chinese because the terrain would basically accentuate all the Japanese superiorities and mobility and firepower and maneuver. And the place to make the first great battle was in Shanghai, which is where this incredible urban labyrinth would give a maximum effectiveness to a Chinese armed forces who were strong in numbers and small arms and weak in just about everything else. And so beginning in August of 1937 to November 1937, there's this titanic battle in the city of Shanghai. Before it's over, there will be three quarters of a million Chinese and a quarter of a million Japanese, a total of a million troops in total fighting in Shanghai. This is the greatest battle in an urban center until Stalingrad in 1942. And when that battle begins, there was a century of Chinese history going back to the Opium Wars that was before everyone, including the Japanese and the rest of the world. And everyone assumed that while the Chinese might put up a show of resistance for a week or two, or maybe a month or two, but pretty soon, as soon as the Japanese got some serious forces deployed there, the Chinese would be thrashed and have to submit to whatever terms Japan chose to dictate. Well, the battle went on for first days, and then weeks, and then months. There's sort of this black humor moment I, I like. It's in the New York Times. And basically, because the Chinese now had gone on with this first resistance for far longer than anyone uh, started, this New York Times reporter asked this uh, Japanese uh, Imperial Army officer, who's sort of this 
the spin doctor, as we call it now for Imperial Japan, is saying, well, you know, how, how is it that the Chinese have not been thrashed and routed by this time? And the, the Japanese officer says, well, the Chinese know so little of tactics, they don't know when to retreat, which is an incredible way of, of phrasing this. Well, in the end, however, the Japanese, their superior uh, firepower, a maneuver air power, eventually is going to uh, overcome the Chinese and they will take Shanghai. But the Chinese, the Chinese have put up fierce resistance and politically, it's enormously significant. It's sort of like the Battle of Bunker Hill during the American Revolution. We may have lost the battle, but the implications of the battle are that we can go sustain resistance, effective resistance. And in the end, if we just hold out, we can prevail. And that's essentially what happens at Shanghai. The Japanese are shocked at the level of casualties they have sustained, although they are much fewer than Chinese losses. About 40,000 total Japanese casualties were killed and wounded, about 10,000 are killed. And there's over 180,000 uh, Chinese uh, casualties, about a uh, quarter or a third of them are killed. And they lose a lot of their trained officers in, in Shanghai, which is going to have a detriment on their effectiveness afterwards or whatever. But this is a, an event which even though they lose the battle, the political effect of this is tremendous. Well, the Japanese still are under the assumption that if they just keep pushing a little bit, the Chinese are going to fold up. So they drive on from Shanghai and head to Nanjing, which was then the nationalist capital, up the Yangtze River from Shanghai. And when they get to Shanghai, they commit what's now been called the, the Nanjing uh, Massacre. It's this incredible episode in which there's this uh, incredible uh, orgy of killing of Chinese combatants and non-combatants. A lot of this is done in front of the cameras, both still in motion picture of Westerners. And this is gonna have an indelible impact on the image of what that war is like, not only in China, but, but throughout the world. Everyone expects that after they've lost Shanghai and Nanjing, the Chinese will quit. But Zhang and his uh, subordinates are by no means prepared to quit. So the battle lurches on in 1938 into a struggle around the, what are called the Wuhan cities, which we've recently heard a lot about. And they're further up the Yangtze River. They're about 800 miles inland up the Yangtze River. And that's where Zhang has his military and, and temporary uh, government headquarters. And a battle is gonna be fought in the area uh, approaching Wuhan. It's gonna take cover the period from April of 1938 to November of 1938. In the beginning of this, the Chinese actually win a major battle against the Japanese who become very uh, rash in their maneuvers and let a couple of their columns get isolated and push back. First retreat that the Japanese have to do in the war. Well, the Japanese are driving on Wuhan, both a thrust up the Yangtze River and another thrust coming in more or less from the Northwest. And at one point, that thrust that's coming in from the Northwest looks like it's about to break through a Chinese resistance and drive on uh, to Wuhan in short order. And at that point, Shang and his, many of his senior officers believe that this is a deadly threat, that if the Japanese, in fact, manage to get all the way to the Wuhan cities that quickly, it could possibly be a fatal blow to Chinese resistance. And the only way they can identify to stop that Japanese thrust is to breach the Yellow River dikes, which Shang does. This is by far and away the greatest environmental casual, uh, tragedy of the Second World War. The death toll is believed to have been somewhere between half a million people and as many as 900,000. It tells you something about the awareness of this whole uh, war, that it would be absolutely unbelievable for something of this magnitude to have happened in Europe and that it not having, having been uh, a featured part of the standard history. Yet that's the story of the war that China and Japan are faced or, uh, conducting in 1938. While the Japanese have uh, firepower superiority, they are tactically and operationally more sophisticated. They have naval superiority, they have air superiority. And although the Chinese resistance is mixed in places it's quite fierce, and the Japanese have a trump, poison gas, which they use repeatedly to break the most stalwart Chinese resistance. And the other thing that's going on at this point is that a secret order has been issued in Tokyo back in August of 1937, 
that advises the Japanese forces that all of the uh, international agreements that Japan has entered into governing the conduct of warfare do not apply in fighting the Chinese, which is why this conflict is going to be such a savage uh, struggle and sets the tone for what's going to happen later in the Asia Pacific War. Well, the Japanese eventually do get to the Wuhan cities, but by that point, it again, in China, this seems to be evidence of sustained resistance, the kind of resistance, an effective resistance, the kind of resistance that China has not been able to manifest for a century. And Zhang and his leaders, uh, subordinates believe that now, uh, if they just hold out and do not quit, eventually they can prevail. And what we now know from evidence is only released uh, years and years later, decades later, is that in Imperial General Headquarters in Tokyo in November 1938, there's a secret war diary at the Imperial, Imperial Army Operations Section. And in that war diary, they write, it's now clear that Japan cannot prevail against China by military means alone. In other words, they concede that they are now in a quagmire in China. And this will have enormous effect, as I'll talk about a little bit later. Now, Another aspect about what's going on here is the notion that the Chinese communists are actually doing all the fighting and the nationalists are simply sitting back. Uh, the reality is that Zhang effectively is leading this coalition. It's not just his own revolutionary army that uh, is doing all the fighting. They're doing it in, in collaboration with uh, armies and units from all over this mosaic of regional and local power brokers who are uh, gathered together under uh, recognizing Zhang as the, as the leader uh, although the level of cooperation at times is not that great. And the Chinese communists uh, uh, are uh, involved in the war, but uh, historian Jay Taylor of Harvard, uh, when he did a recent uh, 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 current biography of Zhang, had a very excellent idea to go to Moscow to look in the records of the Communist International in turn to see what reports the Chinese Communist Party were turning into uh, Moscow and, and hence to Stalin. And what he found was that the report that uh, the Chinese communists uh, sent to Moscow after the first two years of the war uh, indicated that the total Chinese military casualties to that point were about a million. And the portion of those that were attributable to the Red Army, the Chinese Communist Army, was about 31,000, percent There's also a similar report in December 1944, which puts Red Army casualties at about 100,000, by which time total Chinese military casualties are probably approaching 3 million, again, 3%. Now, this is not a perfect metric of the effort of the Chinese communists because they're also engaging a lot of puppet troops over here. But it illustrates the notion that the Chinese communists are doing all the heavy lifting, the heavy fighting, and the nationalists are not simply is, is a myth that uh, we can no longer uh, abide by. Now, having covered basically the military aspects, now I want to take you and show you how we go from this military background into these um, political, economic, and social effects of the war. Uh, one of the most important things that uh, Japan does in the opening phases of this war is that they impose a naval blockade on the China's Pacific coast. And this has uh, stupendous effects on the war and on China and on the ultimate history of China from that point forward. First of all, of course, the blockade is designed to cut off munition shipments to resupply the Chinese. And the Japanese have also overrun uh, the coastal areas, and particularly, they've effectively driven Chiang Kai-shek out of his base area, the seven provinces in, in uh, South Central China. He pretty much has been expelled from all of those areas, pushed into the interior where he has to negotiate with various regional and local power brokers. Uh, his army has been damaged by its heavy fighting. It's not as intimidating as it was to the regional power brokers. And Zhang is in a situation where he has to negotiate more than simply order a lot of his coalition partners around to get what he wants uh, to do. Now, uh, in addition to this, his uh, commanders who previously had been uh, free to, uh, of, of Zhang's military forces, have been free to basically concentrate on military duties. They find themselves frequently now engaged in conducting civil affairs because they have to find ways to feed their troops, which formerly was taken care of by the nationalist government. And in many other ways, it, it impairs 
their uh, effectiveness. But by far the most devastating effect of this is that blockade coupled to overrunning the base area uh, does stupendous damage to the revenues flowing to the central government. The Chinese central government had been set up before Shang for more than a, a century, such that literally almost exactly half of all the revenue funding going to the nationalist government came from customs duties. When the Japanese blockade the coast, they radically reduced the amount of customs duties flowing to the national government. In addition, in overrunning those provinces that they do, they also put a big dent into another major funding source, the land tax. So it's estimated that the revenues flowing to the nationalist government collapse by between two thirds and 75%. Now, how, how do you wage war without money? Well, you can't, and it's not actually flowing in. What do you do? You print it. And this is what the nationalists are compelled to do. And what this does is it creates uh, this enormous problem of inflation, which by uh, in a couple of years is gonna be identified as the single biggest problem in China. It's like a leukemia weakening the whole system. It also severely erodes uh, Zhang's uh, relationships with his armed forces and his civil government because civil servants on fixed incomes uh, pay where the purchasing power or, or plummeting are going to be in an extremely difficult situation uh, in terms of sustaining themselves and their family. And this is an tremendous incentive to this uh, corruption, which has also become a feature of that. And when you talk about uh, infecting China in World War II, the effect of uh, this uh, revenue loss and inflation is one of the primary reasons why that corruption exists. Now, the other thing that Japan's war does to China is it creates what effectively is this enormous tidal wave of refugees. Now, in at the wartime period, it, it, it first estimate was like, like 3 million of them. And then eventually they were saying, well, there were 95 million Chinese who at one time or another became refugees during the war. Uh, I, I followed uh, an American historian named uh, Lu, who uh, of Chinese descent, and she estimates, she thinks it was probably about 45 million. And since I always tend to go for lower rather than higher numbers, I, I tend to use that. But even so, that's almost, unimaginable number, that's 10% of the population. Uh, it was called by one Chinese uh, historian, the greatest migration in all history, which it clearly is. 45 million people taking a foot to flee from the Japanese, primarily because the stories have spread about how savage the Japanese are, as they had been at Nanjing, uh, of uh, slaughtering military age males, whether they're actually soldiers or not, and what they're doing to Chinese women. Uh, of course, is uh, horrendous also. And the stories that come out of this, these tracks are unbelievable because the, the people fleeing have no idea initially how far, how long it's gonna be. They run out of food. You have scenes described by a journalist like Frida Utley where Chinese families are marching along and they reach the absolutely horrendous moment where the parents realize they, they can't save all their children and they abandon children along the way. I mean, it's almost impossible to uh, describe all of the horrors that flow from this. Now, what happens as a result of this, however, is very important in terms of Chinese history and, and Chinese social relations. Up to that point in time, the only what we call social welfare uh, obligations of the Chinese government uh, was uh, maintaining the dikes, uh, particularly on the Yellow and, and Yangtze rivers, and also some efforts at uh, maintaining granaries uh, to guard against famine. Everything else, uh, in what we now call uh, uh, social support, uh, welfare, whatever, here, that was all managed at the local uh, or regional level by what were called local or, or regional uh, organizations, as well as private uh, benefactors, uh, up to and including uh, bandits who would contribute sometimes. So that uh, had been the whole pattern of Chinese history for thousands of years. And it's this refugee crisis that has now Shang's government taking the lead to insert the national government into an effort to provide uh, medical care, housing, and treatment for all these masses of refugees fleeing before the Japanese. This is a fundamental turning point in, in China's history. Now, uh, in addition to uh, uh, these aspects, one other thing about Wuhan, that summer of 1938, is going to become known as the most open, uh, and free political and artistic period 
that mainland China is going to know in the 20th century and, and indeed right down to today. Uh, under that particular environment, uh, there is really true uh, pluralism and freedom, publications, uh, publishers of uh, editors of uh, newspapers and, and uh, journals or whatever here are not murdered as was commonplace in Chinese history up to that point. Uh, it also is the first time in Chinese history in which intellectuals literally from all over China uh, who have fled before the Japanese are now intermingled together in Wuhan. So from that aspect, it's also a very important part of Chinese history. What uh, the total effect of all of this, uh, I've, I've described this uh, in, in the book, one passage, I think it, it sort of tries to encapsulate all this. And, and I state as, as follows. For the state, it led to unprecedented levels of centralized power and direct commitment to provisions of relief measures for society and provided a potent impetus to creating a national rather than a local or regional identity. And for the individual, it inflicted severe damage on the ancient, ancient primary uh, identification with uh, a multi-generational family and a clan and commenced a profound psychological slide towards atomization. It would permit herding of the population for a quarter of a century after 1949 into social and economic experiments, some of which proved to be stupendously uh, destructive. Now, having uh, covered China, let me turn now to another aspect about what's in this particular volume, and that is uh, the path to Pearl Harbor. And to simplify everything down to one simple statement, what I present here is a, a historical argument that the path to Pearl Harbor led through the Soviet Union and China in the second half of 1941. So how, how did this come about? Well, we have to start with the fact that Hitler attacks the Soviet Union on June 22nd, 1941. Uh, when that onslaught begins, it is the expectation in Washington and in London that the Germans will prevail. It's only a question of how long. The official estimate that the U.S. Army uh, issues, which is passed on up the chain of command, is the Soviets will hold out between one and three months before collapse. Uh, very similar estimates are given uh, in, in London. And that's how events seem to uh, uh, play out for the first several weeks of the conflict. And this brings us to one other very interesting aspect, because uh, neither the British nor the Americans really had anyone on the ground in uh, the area where the battle was taking place to really provide independent assessments of what's going on. The only source of really realistic evidence about what's happening, uh, interestingly enough, were the communiques issued in Berlin and Moscow. And these communiques, bore no relationship to one another in terms of how they described the daily uh, battles. But gradually what happens is that these communiques are published every single day in the New York Times on page two, and you can read them. And what you eventually see as you, as you read these communiques is where the fighting is taking place. And what this clearly shows is the, so the German forces plunging deeply into the Soviet Union until the last 10 days of July of 1941, and suddenly the front freezes, it stabilizes. And for the first time, the prospect appears that the Soviet Union might actually withstand the German onslaught. Now the strategic importance of this is almost beyond calculation. If the Soviets hang on, the prospects of the allies holding out and eventually overcoming Nazi Germany goes up enormously. So in both London and Washington, when this prospect appears, they look at what they can do. And the answer is brutal, that basically the British are overextended, the Americans are unready, the logistical aspect of trying to get things to uh, the Soviet Union during 1941 are very dismal. But what they both look at and decide is this, if there's one thing that they can do, it's this, they're deathly afraid that if Imperial Japan attacks the Soviet Union in the Far East, that this might be the death blow to the Soviet Union. And thus, they identify keeping China in the war, to keep the Japanese tied down, prevent 
the Japanese from delivering this fatal blow to uh, Soviet resistance is a critical feature of the war. China cannot be abandoned. Now, what's happening on the Japanese side? Well, from the Japanese perspective, the supreme strategic issue is this quagmire in China. And what the Japanese are striving for in 1941, and particularly in this diplomatic dance that the US and Japan are gonna do in the second half, the Japanese want to extract themselves from uh, the China quagmire, but they want to do so being able to claim to their public that they've had this tremendous victory. And so when you break down the diplomatic stance that Japan is advancing to the US during these negotiations, it is one of two propositions that the Japanese want us to agree to. The first of which they want the US to agree to impose upon China a peace settlement, which will clearly show uh, Japan is the victor and China is defeated. And the second, an alternative proposition the Japanese are advancing is that they want the US to agree to abandon all military, economic, political, and psychological support to China in the belief that the Chinese are only holding out, hoping that they will eventually gain allies, which is exactly Jiang's strategy. And that if they remove that prospect, China's resistance will collapse. So that's the Japanese uh, stance. Now what is also going on at this time is, a, is another factor that plays out in terms of what's happening. Uh, the um, US has been providing Japan, Imperial Japan, is between 75 and 80% of all its petroleum that Japan has been using uh, since 1937. And this presents President Franklin Roosevelt with this horrendous moral and strategic dilemma. On the one hand, if we're giving the Japanese the great majority of petroleum to wage war in China, we are also morally uh, under obligation of the Chinese because we're basically fueling a Japanese war machine which is killing Chinese by the millions. By mid-1941, the total number of Chinese deaths just on a linear basis probably is about seven and a half million. And we've been giving the Japanese war machine all this petroleum to conduct this, these campaigns in, in China. But the strategic problem is this, that President Roosevelt understands the American people are not keen about entering a war, even though their, their support has gone overwhelmingly to the Chinese, because that's one of the other aspects about what's been going on since 1937. The American people at first, when they're first polled about what uh, their attitude is towards this war between China and Japan. Uh, at first, uh, the majority of people are indifferent as to which side wins. By February of 1940, particularly because of all of these images that are coming out of China of this horrendous war, uh, a Gallup poll shows that the American people by that point, when they're asked who they support or favor in, in the war, they come in at 2% for Japan and 76% for China. And the, the balance, split between those who have no opinion and, and, uh, and, and, and th th that basically shows you that there's this overwhelmingly popular support for uh, the Chinese. It was also aware of, but he does not think it's gonna translate into a willingness to go to war. And he knows that if we cut off our petroleum, the Japanese will instantly uh, march down to the Dutch East Indies, which has all the, the oil that they possibly could need and seize that. And the net result of all that is going to be the Japanese war machine will again have all the petroleum it needs to continue its war. And the American people will probably not support a war to defend a European colonial uh, uh, enclave in the Far East. So that's the tremendous dilemma he faces. Now, meanwhile, the Japanese have advanced into southern uh, Indochina. And President Roosevelt initially proposes an embargo of, uh, of oil on a temporary basis. But he then goes to what's called the Atlantic Conference in August of 1940, uh, 1941 with uh, Prime Minister Winston Churchill. And while he's there, his principal aide, a man named Harry Hopkins, who'd been off on a special diplomatic mission for Roosevelt, had managed to get to Moscow and have a direct uh, uh, audience with uh, Stalin, who was incredibly forthcoming uh, about what was going on. And one of the things that Hopkins comes back to this uh, conference with Churchill and Roosevelt, e e explaining is that the Soviets are insistent 
if the U.S. should issue a declaration that if the uh, uh, Japanese enter the war against the Soviet Union, the U.S. will enter the war against Japan. Of course, Hopkins can't make that pledge, but it shows that this thinking is exactly the same in Washington, in London, and in Moscow. It's absolutely imperative to keep the Japanese from attacking the Soviet Union. And so with this information, and after consulting with Churchill, Roosevelt decides to continue the embargo uh, of oil because it's obvious that not only is it uh, in petroleum that would be used to wage a war against China, it's petroleum that the Japanese could use to attack the Soviet Union, which would be a strategic disaster. Now, the evidence of this, uh, you have to tease out by going very deeply into the diplomatic papers to understand not only what the Japanese are saying in terms of their formal papers, but what they really mean. That's when I talked about how they want the U.S. to agree to imposing a treaty or abandoning China. That's what comes through overwhelmingly when you have the Japanese diplomats, both in Washington and in, in Tokyo, describing what their um, uh, diplomatic position is. And you, you can see that this obviously runs headlong into the fact that we believe that the Chinese are absolutely in, in, playing an indispensable role strategically in keeping in Japan delivering a fatal blow against the Soviet Union. So we see, in my view, that the true a firm linkage between the war in Europe and the Asia Pacific War actually begins in that second half of 1941, when the diplomatic uh, and military realities show that China now is not only very important in the Asia Pacific region, but is it critically important in uh, the whole global struggle, and particularly the sus uh, sustaining the Soviet Union. Well, I've, I've covered a good deal, and there's a good deal more to be said. Uh, but in sum, obviously, this narrative is, uh, I hope, to create a new sort of master narrative of this whole Asia Pacific war. Uh, it's global in scope, uh, it's uh, an attempt to create this entirely new and vast canvas of events, and not only military, but political, economic, and social, all the way across the globe, and to tie that into where we are today. So thank you very much. Good evening, Rich. Good evening. It's good to see you. Thanks once again for being with us. We always appreciate it. And it's always an education, that's for sure. So we are very thankful that you're here with us again tonight. Uh, of course, as always, we've got a lot of questions already coming in. Uh, the first one is, how much do you think the Japanese defeat by the Red Army at the Battle of Nomanhan in the summer of 1939 went into their decisions to go south? and the Dutch East Indies rather than North against the Soviet Union in 1941? That's a, that's a really good question. And the, the answer is, uh, it's sort of gone through this uh, series of, uh, of, of uh, re reviews and revelations and, and revisions. Uh, initially, it was sort of ignored in the West as to how important the battle really was. I mean, the, the Japanese absolutely thrashed the Imperial Army in this, uh, in this border battle. It was a traumatic event for the Japanese. Uh, then there was an argument that when it was recognized was that, well, this was really what uh, foreclosed the Japanese from going north against the Soviet Union in, in 1941 uh, and going south. Well, it's more complicated than that. We know now that right when the Germans first attacked in, uh, in Tokyo, the foreign minister, a fellow named Matsuoka, and a significant a swath of the Imperial Army immediately was sort of raw, raw, let's go into the war and join this with the Soviets. And they began this huge buildup. They, they built up their forces in Manchuria to like 700,000 men. In fact, uh, according to the Japanese records now, they had the war ministry, which was the more cautious part of the Japanese leadership, became alarmed that they kept building forces up in Manchuria and they were afraid that the Wangton Army in Manchuria would, would off on its own attack the Soviet Union. So, uh, but what eventually uh, controls is they recognize, first of all, that they've got the quagmire in China, and secondly, they've got to have petroleum. Uh, they can't do anything without petroleum. So in, in effect, 
that cutting off petroleum is the, is the master stroke that basically forecloses a realistic prospect of the Japanese trying to go into the Soviet Union in 1941. Not that there were not Japanese parts of the leadership that wanted to do so, but the more realistic prospect was that it was simply not doable uh, uh, in terms of the economy without getting oil first. Got it. Was the Marco Polo Bridge incident of 1937 deliberately contrived by the Japanese to start a war with China, just as the Manchuria Railroad incident of 1931 was used as an excuse for Japan to occupy Manchuria, or was it just a serendipitous opportunity to do so? It was, it was basically the serendipitous opportunity. And actually, what had been going on for some time was there had been, there had been these uh, conflicts, small-scale, low-level conflicts, many, many such things between the Chinese and Japanese forces in China as the Japanese kept encroaching on Chinese sovereignty. And what eventually happens in 37 is that it's the point where, first of all, Shang has been conducting this preparation. And he, his, uh, his principal German advisor tells him, I think you're ready. <laughs> never, never listen to German advisors. That's one of the big messages here. Over here. Anyway, and secondly, uh, by the point that they're getting now really close to Beijing, this is also putting them within striking distance, Shang feels, of where Shang's base area is. And it basically, he abides letting them uh, continue on down as they're going. Uh, it's going to be, you know, dire uh, prospects. And I think also ultimately it is, it's just, he has this, his political sense is that he's used up all the goodwill that he, he reasonably can expect from the other parts of the Chinese uh, leadership, the people he has to deal with and, and to still claim to be leader. He writes about that specifically, that if he gives in any more, he's going to forfeit his claim to be the rightful leader of China, whatever here. So that's just at all, all these events sort of coalesce at that moment. There's nothing special, and there's certainly not planned by the Japanese to provoke anything. Whatever, it's it's completely, uh, it completely certain. One of the one of the really odd things about this, in terms of history, as opposed to no novelist would do this, right? The two principal Japanese officers at the Marco Polo Bridge incident are a guy named uh, Muruguchi, and the other guy is Ichiki, right? And if you chart Japan's advance. They go from Japan and south, and then there's sort of this fish hook, one part going over to India, the other part going to Guadalcanal. But Metaguchi is over in uh, India, the Burma India border. Kawaguchi ends up at Guadalcanal. So the two guys who sparked the war end up at the farthest points of advance uh, of, of Japan. So, and Metaguchi is very, uh, at least the accounts say that. He, he has the sense of guilt that he got Japan into this mess wow. by 1944. And part of what he does in this offensive attempt to go into India is all part of ex expiating his guilt for the Marco Polo Bridge incident. I mean, you, you, you can't make stuff up like this. You know, <laughs> that's what's so great about history. Amazing. It seems like both the Chinese and the British had the inclination in March of pulling back their forces to the north ends of the Irrawaddy and the Satang River Valleys just south of Mandalay. But they were pressured into deploying further south by Stilwell for an ill-thought elastic defense and counteroffensive. This put them 100 kilometers closer to the Japanese and meant less time for Chinese troops to arrive and for coordination issues to be sorted. As you say in the book, it allowed the Japanese to destroy allied formations in the South and then go on to take the whole colony. And this leads to two questions. How much of the Japanese drive to take the whole of Burma was opportunistic, a result of unexpectedly being able to smash all of the allied divisions during February to April before the monsoon? Yeah, I think that uh, that's clearly part of it. I mean, uh, well, I, you also have to understand that by the time that they're seriously moving into Burma. This is, this is like February, March, uh, 1942. They've, they've had this incredible run of success since December 41. It's like they have, you know, what they sometimes call victory disease. They mm -hmm. think they're unstoppable. There's no limits on what they can do. So that's, that's part of it. But certainly crushing uh, the allied forces in the more southerly parts of Burma certainly, you know, helps uh, speed things. Because one thing that, that, uh, let me spool this back a little bit. One of the most startling things in the research I did was coming to a very contrary opinion about Joseph Stilwell from what I thought going in. And that's 
in a nutshell, the basic reason was all the information we had was basically generated by Stillwell or Stillwell's acolytes. It's only when you get the Chinese side and some of the British side more that you really begin to appreciate. Uh, Shan gives Stillwell a, a really cogent briefing about how to handle the Chinese armies and how to handle the situation in Burma early in March of uh, 42 when they first meet. If you read that, the accounts of that, even even Tuckman's account, if you tease out what she reports and put it together a little bit differently, Chang is giving very sensible advice about, you know, hey, look, there are great operational limitations on our forces. The British Commonwealth forces have been collaborated. They're not really effective anymore. You know, we can't afford to uh, basically launch this big offensive like Stillwell talks about. The best we can do is hold out defensively on some higher ground and more southerly parts of Burma, and then wait for the monsoon to really stop the Japanese. Well, Stillwell completely blows that uh, up. And he, he, I mean, he, it's terrible. It, it, could have, it could have been a lot worse. I mean, it, Stillwell totally screws up. I mean, my opinion of Stillwell just went you know, way down. And what's also interesting is that on the British Commonwealth side, the guy who's in charge is uh, uh, General William Slim who is undoubtedly one of the great commanders of the Second World War. Right. And there I'm looking at, you know, sort of this, here's Stillwell, here's Slim. And Slim is, you know, in a terrible situation, great leadership. Uh, and, you know, if you were making a comparison at the end of it, you know, Stillwell's up here and, and uh, uh, Slim is up here and Stillwell is down out of the screen or whatever here in, in my <laughs> estimation. The second part of that one was, would the original plan of seeding the southern half of Burma to mount a defense of the north have gone better? It's hard to imagine getting worse. Yeah, I think I kind of answered that. That's, that's yeah. exactly right. Exactly yeah. right. That the, way that, the way that that was, that uh, Burma campaign was conducted uh, was, uh, you know, it was, it was a terrible disaster. The other thing that Zhang, uh, and this is one of the biggest mistakes that Zhang makes, is that uh, still when things fall apart, Stillwell marches out in this famous walkout. Okay, which you know would have been impressive for a field grade officer to take about a hundred men out of out of Burma in those circumstances. He he goes out of Burma with what's the equivalent of two squads. He went in with two armies. He walks out with two squads with him or whatever here. And what we know now from the Chinese sources is that he didn't really fully inform Shang about what was going on. Shang doesn't know for quite some time the full story of what happened. And later he says, you know, he abandoned a hundred thousand of my men in, in Burma, which is basically true. You know, and uh, and this gets into volume two, but basically Shang is thinking seriously about asking for the recall of Stillwell in the summer of 42, and Madame Shang talks him out of it over here, which is probably a big, big disaster for, for the Chinese and for certainly for Shang in the long run. Right. Yeah, but that whole, that whole Burma story is, uh, you know, I, I never really you know, got into the weeds on that. And boy, once you get in there, uh, it, you know, the narrative you have to follow now based on the new evidence is just radically different from what we believe for a long time. Excellent. Uh, good evening. Uh, that's coming from the question. Thank you for hosting this and sharing your good research. I, he says he enjoyed both your books on Guadalcanal and Tower of Skulls. And he says he has one question for you. Uh, Gifu position on Guadalcanal and the defense of Buna were early indications of the Japanese army's excellent defensive skills. However, where did they develop these tactics? They didn't experience anything like the Western Front in World War I, and most of their fighting prior to these battles had been offensive in nature. That's a good question. And um, I think uh, the, the, the Japanese uh, had developed a, a, a coherent tactical, operational, and strategic doctrine. It was all based on the notion their principal enemy was Russia, later the Soviet Union. Whatever here. It was highly offensive in its character because they believed that being severely outnumbered and outgunned, the only way they could prevail was to seize the initiative with extremely aggressive tactics at the beginning, uh, night attacks, you know, trying to penetrate the enemy's lines and get to the interior, get their headquarters and basically unbalance them. That was how they were going to win. So that was how they were, you know, they were they they didn't spend much time on defense. Whatever you're to say the least. Right. So then they get into uh, certain phases. Now, part of it in China, you know, after things stabilized in 1938, they, they, a lot of the Japanese units are having to fight defensively to, you know, defend railway lines or bridges or things like that. So there's not 
the absence of any uh, such thing. But they basically are very, uh, they're very naturally talented uh, and they will, the Japanese soldiers will dig. They're ordered to dig, unlike Western armies where there's a certain reluctance about digging or whatever here, the Japanese soldiers will dig and they have a natural flair for creating positions and camouflaging them. So that's, that's really uh, where that comes into play. And they are, they are extremely good at that. And of course, and above all, their battle ethics of uh, basically everyone's going to die. Yeah. Uh, regardless of the pointlessness of it or whatever, it's just un totally unmatched. Why would the Japanese attack the Soviet Union again after the 1939 disasters? Didn't the U.S. and the British understand this? Um, I don't think I don't think our leadership fully understood that at, at that time. And and basically, you know, once again, the Japanese Imperial Army leadership, you know, they believed that the Soviet Union was the enemy number one. Right. They wanted to deal with them, and they had their eyes on making these incursions on the Asian continent. Uh, they were shocked by Nomahan, but like I said, you know, uh, initially, uh, by no means were all Japanese officers resolved to never, you know, we aren't going to try that again. You know, uh, and and the other thing that's going on in the background, this this affects all the Japanese calculations uh, from, from, well, from the latter part of the 30s to 40s too. You know, the Germans seem like they are the winning team. Mm. I mean, they are winning and winning and winning no matter how, how badly they're outnumbered. In fact, I opened the second volume uh, with a, a prologue I called Midnight. And I just recite, you know, how the war had been going up to, the, you know, mid-1942. And when you just recite all the major events that have been going on, what you find out is the Axis is winning almost all the time. And where the allies or the people we wish well uh, have had some success, it's by no means clear that those are permanent uh, successes. The Battle yeah. of Britain, the battle before Moscow, it's not clear in 1940 or 1941 that those are you know, permanent successes that they can't be, re there's no allied victory that is not potentially reversible uh, through the middle of 1942. And this is really driven home when Trubok falls in June of 1942. It had been a much celebrated successful defense in 1941 and Rommel takes it in a couple of days in 1942. And it's like, once again, uh, emphasizing that there just doesn't seem to be at that point uh, any absolute confidence uh, the Allies will prevail. Richard Overy in, in a book called How the Allies Won, he makes that point. He says, any rational person who was looking at the war in the spring of 1942 would not have been able to guess how it was going to turn out by 1945 because the evidence of Allied success was so scanty. Right, right. We have another one. Uh, what to, to what extent do you believe some historians, as in a war to be won, that MacArthur's advance up the northern coast of New Guinea was necessary after the Allied conquest of Guadalcanal and Buna secured Australia and New Zealand sea communications. Would the war have ended sooner and with fewer U.S. casualties if we had only engaged in King's Central Pacific strategy? <laughs> That's one of the all-time great uh, debate questions about the whole uh, two-hour uh, answer we're waiting yeah, for. <laughs> right, right, I know, I know. You know, uh, and, uh, and I've, I'm sure you, and I know you have too. I mean, you you can read these uh, arguments. Uh, it seems to be very compelling. We should have only have gone to the Central Pacific. No, no, no. We should only have gone to the Southwest Pacific or whatever here. And uh, what really I I think really uh, impressed me was when I was doing the book Downfall about the very end of the war. And you get down to invading Japan and the Japanese have no trouble identifying where we're going to land. It's sort of like if we had concentrated on one track alone or the other, sure, the first couple moves might have been very successful, but then we would have clearly identified where we're going. Right. And we would have basically channeled ourselves into places where our numerical superiority would account for a whole lot less. I mean, if, if they knew we were coming to the Marianas much in advance, and instead of having, you know, um, what, what was it about? Uh, 65, 70,000 troops there. If they had, you know, 120,000 troops there, uh, <laughs> that would have been a hell of a lot of different equation or whatever. Wow. So as, as we know, and it's been talked about a lot, you know, that the, the, we had the resources to do it, to do the two advances. And what they did was they whipsawed the Japanese. And the other thing was that attrition phase of the war in the Pacific from basically Guadalcanal to the about November of 1943, which bled down the Japanese air forces and some of their lightning it was absolutely critical because you, when you look at the entirety of the Pacific War, the advances to November 1943, uh, starting from Guadalcanal or 
on New Guinea or whatever, are very modest, you know, 300 miles, something like that. You know, and as people wrote at that time, you know, at that rate, we'll get to Tokyo in 1962 or something like that. <laughs> you know? And then from November of 43, uh, 43 to August of 45, you know, we're, we're advancing by thousands of miles or whatever here, you know, so it just, the character of the war totally changes. And it's uh, primarily due to the ability for resources and the attrition of the Japanese. Hmm. How serious was the influence of Christian missionaries in China and U.S. Western public opinion? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think it was, uh, I, I, I try, actually tried to get into that. Uh, because one of the things that is was was one of these conduits about what's going on in China was the missionaries, American missionaries in China, who were tied to frequently local uh, 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 churches or whatever here. And a very common feature in America in that period from 37 to Pearl Harbor was reading reading the letter from the missionary in China at the services or whatever here. And I heard lots of anecdotal stories about, including my editor, Robert Loomis at, at Random House, that he remembered as a boy mm. listening to those uh, letters being read. So uh, I had a, a research assistant and he, he embarked on trying to find archival information from these missionary, uh, from the churches, their missionary efforts about, so we could kind of document and provide some, you know, solid data as opposed to just anecdotal data. Uh, and the answer was that the records that we could access didn't really help us. Mm -hmm. But I think it was it, it was a, a major thing, a combination of, and that was part of a larger thing of, uh, I can't emphasize enough, all this visual evidence coming out of China, the pictures, the motion pictures, or whatever here. Uh, one of my good friends and colleagues, uh, Thomas Doherty at Brandeis, who is a specialist in uh, he's American studies, but he does particularly American film, and not just the feature films or whatever here, but the newsreels. He went through all these newsreels that everyone was seeing when they went on average twice a week. There was a newsreel each time. He says one of the things that really surprised him was when he looked at those from 37 to Pearl Harbor, he said the amount of really graphic, viscerally stomach-churning stomach evidence of what Japan was doing, particularly in China, was vastly greater than anything they were saying about the Nazis because the Germans didn't let people run around taking photographs. Or right. Whatever. So uh, when people think that the American anger about Japan suddenly blossomed at Pearl Harbor, it was already at a very high level, even before the first bomb fell on Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor was like throwing cat kerosene on an already raging wow. inferno. And it goes back to the fact that, you know, uh, it, I had, a, I had in another talk I do, I have a couple images that were just, were like, you know, if you'd showed them to the average group of Americans in 1945, everyone or virtually everyone would have said, well, that is out of China. They may have been able to give you more specifics about it. They had nothing like that with respect to what the Germans have been doing until literally we overran those camps in April and May of 45. Right, right. First time when they really got the graphic visceral images that really brought home what the Nazis had really been up to. Hmm. Can you comment on the German military assistance to China? How significant was it to China's war effort and how did it change as alliances shifted? Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. As part of this buildup that Zhang was trying to conduct from 1932 onward to get ready for a war with Japan, he had German advisors and was buying a lot of his equipment from Germany. And uh, as I mentioned in 37, I mean, he had a major German <laughs> advisor, you know, telling him that now's the time to go into the war. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but what happens is that uh, Hitler then eventually, of course, forms an alliance with Japan and Hitler eventually is going to cut off this uh, military alliance and relationship with, uh, with, uh, between the Germans and, 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 and the Chinese or whatever here. And then the Soviets are gonna step in for a while until 41 to help the Chinese also, because they're seeing it the same way that eventually we, we see it too, is that you know, as long as the Japanese are tied down to China, this is good for the Soviet Union. Yeah, yeah. Um, why was the Japanese leadership willing to submit their country to an existential struggle in China? Could they have st stopped the expansion of their conquest in 37 and have avoided a larger war? Yes, I, yes. And the short answer to that is yes. And, and some, of the, some of the Chinese leadership, uh, some of the Japanese leadership, there was a, a chief of the operations section of the Imperial Army's general staff, a, name, a guy named Ishiwara. And that was exactly what he thought is that, you know, we, we can't right. 
permit ourselves to become involved in this huge war in China. The principal enemy is the Soviet Union. We can't be diverted away from this. And if we get involved, it's going to turn it, he identified, it's going to be a, a quagmire. He and, and that, and analogized it to Napoleon in Spain. That's what's going to happen. And uh, he was not alone. There was another, there were other groups of uh, high-ranking Japanese officers who argued the same thing, but they were outnumbered by those who really believed that, that basically, like I said, the, the Chinese simply won't be able to sustain resistance. We just keep pushing a while and they're going to fold up. And that continued into 1938 and then in 38, they realized that no, they're not going to fold up and we're now in a quagmire. Yeah. Could you please comment on Japanese bomber operations and what information Western Air Forces acquired about the successes or failures of operations against Chinese air defenses prior to December 1941? Yeah, that's the whole, uh, that's another part of the lost history of, of this. So the Japanese do a tremendous amount of bombing of Chinese cities, particularly the capital, uh, uh, Chongqing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, of course, by, compared to what comes later, it seems like a very small scale, but at the time, it seemed huge. And it's a very important part of this visual imagery coming out of China. This, uh, you know, they're, they're raiding Chinese cities all across China or whatever, it was all these horrendous images of that. Uh, so that part of it uh, is clear. Uh, the Western powers tend to, to be, uh, they thought the Japanese were still sort of a, a developing power that basically were, you know, copycatting uh, weapons and equipment and doctrine or whatever here. Uh, and they underestimated greatly uh, the Japanese. They thought that, and of course, they were all very Eurocentric, uh, whatever here. So the, the main war was going to be in Europe. Uh, the only guy who really shines in this, of course, is Chanel, uh, who, you know, realizes what it's going to take to actually uh, conduct uh, a fighter com combat with the, with the uh, Japanese because of the dissimilarity of their aircraft and our aircraft. And of course, he brings brings this to the fore with the flying taggers, we have a tremendous uh, effect. And it really, it really is, it should be viewed as the humiliation of the Army Air Forces because uh, Chenault does things with the flying tigers from December of 41 to April of uh, 42. And the Army Air Forces is, is just as a miserable record. Mm -hmm. They just don't realize what they're, what they're getting into. And they, and he sent reports, they, they knew about this and just ignored it. Mm -hmm. Uh, not much said about the emperor. In the period covered by this volume, was he the passive ruler who could not change the empire's direction, or was he tacitly giving approval to the army actions? Yeah, that's, that's another really good question. I have a whole section about just what I think uh, uh, really was happening in Japan, and that's basically this incredibly dysfunctional uh, political and military decision-making outfit. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's fairly complex and it goes back basically to the Meiji Constitution, which uh, quite fundamentally uh, left the army and the navy without a political master. They ostensibly only off answer to the emperor, uh, not to the government, and had various means of collapsing the government if they didn't get their way. Mm. That was number one. Number two, the emperor himself, uh, under the constitution, the way it was originally set up, it was more of, he was going to preside rather than rule. And consistently, except for one instance in 1936, Hirohito up to 1945 had consistently viewed his role as uh, sanctioning what's been agreed upon by the legitimate government or the armed forces or whatever here, not, not that he should be uh, directing policy. Now, he was intelligent. Uh, we know for a fact that he was briefed extensively by the armed forces. He would ask really good questions, but as Ed Dre and, and others have pointed out, you know, he would ask questions and make comments uh, that you could say, well, if, if it were Hitler, that would be an order, right? And if Hitler said it, then pretty much that would be what would happen. With Emperor Hirohito, he says, you know, things and nothing, nothing happens. Uh -huh. He's not, not followed or whatever here. The only exception was in 1936 when there's a mutiny in Tokyo, literally right under his nose. Uh, they kill some of his ministers. He's personally very angry. And the armed forces are dragging their feet on dealing with the mutineers or whatever here. And that's the one time prior to 1945 where he comes in very forcefully. But that just illustrates that up, up to that point, 
you know, he's more, more the presider or whatever. Now, that doesn't exalt, absolve him from moral responsibility. Everything is done in his name. Right. You know? And that's an issue that we're going you know, to deal with, you know, obviously, in 1945 during the occupation or whatever here. But in terms of, of the emperor as sort of a, a, some sort of an analogy to Hitler or Mussolini, he, 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 he fails <laughs> greatly to get up into that category. Mm. What led Japan to move into southern French Indochina in mid-1941? This was the turning point for FDR to embargo oil to Japan. And the Japanese would have known their decision would lead to something serious. Actually, one of the interesting points I found in, in the research was that uh, the Japanese foreign minister uh, in 1940 and 41 was a fellow named Matsuoka. And uh, he's a very uh, uh, checkered character in, in in Japanese history, to say the least. But one of the things that does happen in early uh, uh, 1941 is that uh, the uh, the Japanese uh, army is talking about so occupying southern Indian China. At that point, Matsuoka advises them that well, the the Western powers won't react. You know, they can they basically can get away with it. You know, is what the answer uh, he gives at that time. And that's what they operate on, and they'd occupy uh, northern Indochina in 1940, about July 1940 or whatever here. Now at that time when they did that, they, they had uh, at least an ostensible rationale. The uh, rationale was that that was an uh, entry point for munitions coming in through Hanoi and then flowing up into China that would be participating in the war against Japan. So they occupy Northern uh, Indochina to cut that off. Southern Indochina has nothing whatsoever. There's no conduit from Southern Indochina going up to China right over here. Mm. But it is obviously a, a, a necessary platform for them to take off against the Dutch, the British, and the Americans right over here. And they do it. And the accounts on the Japanese side, they're, they're shocked at how strong the reaction is. They just, they did not comprehend how it would be interpreted, especially by the U.S. Right. Uh, in your research, um, did you find, did your opinion of Chang's leadership and regime, did it change? I mean, I, I think you talked about that in your talk, but um, if you could just elaborate on that. Yeah, uh, you know, it, it's dealing with trying to present Zhang and his uh, nationalists or whatever now. Uh, he, he uh, it's interesting, he, he, his reputation has been sort of on a roller coaster since 1937. Initially, in, in 1937, he was widely regarded as a great hero. I mean, he's, he's, he and his wife are uh, man and woman of the year in Life magazine in, in 1938. <laughs> uh, and there's this enormous American support for Zhang, uh, particularly everyone always mentions uh, Life magazine and the, and the Lifetime publications being a big supporter of Zhang because Henry Luce was the son of Chinese, Chinese missionaries or whatever here. Uh, and then about 1943, the, the whole tone and tenor about what's going on in China uh, changes. And part of it is because uh, the Chinese don't seem to be, quote, doing anything. Well, this gets back to where we are now. When you really understand what their situation was by 1941, 42, well, of course they're not, quote, doing anything because they're in this horrendous situation because of what Japan has done, the blockade and all this other stuff. And from the Chinese standpoint, the allies have done next to nothing. It's, it's incredible how little support we get. We, we, we fly stuff over the hump uh, between uh, a, in April uh, 1942 and October 1945. The total tonnage in that whole period is like 740,000 tons. Well, a Liberty ship was rated for 78,000 tons by weight, 10,000 tons by measurement tons or whatever here. So it's equivalent of like 77 Liberty ships over that entire span, it's like oh, about two a year, two a month, whatever here, you know. And most of that stuff is not going to Shang. It goes to Chenault and the aviators. It goes to uh, Stillwell's uh, outfit or whatever here. So we're giving them nothing. We can't, we can't, and the British, we can't secure their supply line through Burma, you know. So when you look at that realistically, it seems to me the Chinese have a great deal of a case to make. <laughs> yeah, let's say so. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that, every, you know, I'm saying everything that Shang, he was the greatest thing since George Washington, whatever. I mean, the, the, the breach of the Yellow River Dikes is a horrendous thing. A couple other episodes are horrendous also. But basically, when you really get all this new information, uh, like I said, 
he, he simply was not simply trying to avoid war with Japan. He wanted war with Japan. He believed it was necessary. He conducts it. He, after it gets started, some of the same people who have been insisting that you know he go to war with Japan in 1935, some of the first people to start talking about negotiating and surrendering in 1938. You know, <laughs> you know, as he writes in his diary, they've lost their guts or whatever. They, you know, whatever. So it's it's a much more balanced and nuanced position uh, with respect to Shang, but it's not one in which I'm certainly going to whitewash all the all the stuff away. Sure. Yeah. And meanwhile, you know, when you look at what happens with with Mao in the long run, I mean, it, it's a horrendous, horrendous story. Uh, that still, I mean, today in China, I believe the official line is that Mao is like the the seventy thirty guy, right? Seventy percent good, thirty percent bad. Other people might reverse that. Uh, ratio or whatever here, uh, because when you go through the Great Leap Forward and all this other stuff, it's just uh, horrendous. It makes even the breaching the Yellow River dikes to be right. a, a misdemeanor virtually. Wow. Uh, the Pacific War is essentially an American name conferred by post-1945 Americans who see the war in U.S. Navy terms. Any historian who begins the war at Pearl Harbor is telling us only a very small part of the story. Uh, Pearl, Pearl Harbor is akin to chapter four, not chapter one. Uh, Saburo Ianaga rolls the truth back to the 1931-45 war, even marking the commencement in 1931, the Great East Asian War, still does not describe its vast geographical content. Do you think the efforts of American historians has been consciously to diminish Roosevelt's support of Chang because that view places the U.S. position in a position where confrontation with Japan became a certain event? The Pearl Harbor surprise narrative is essentially fake news because the war had been inevitable for years. Well, that's <laughs> that's a very extensive question. I, I don't know where to enter it, actually. Uh, let me let me go on to say that, uh, first of all, I mean, there is this uh, narrative calling it the, the 15 or the 14 years war going back to 1931. And I looked very carefully at that. And uh, there's a historian I greatly respect, Ron Emitter at Oxford University. And um, and he's examined this also. I think the the re rationale he gives, I think I agree with, is that basically, you, you know, if you're going to go back to 31, why not go back to 1894, whatever here, you know, in terms of if it's one in long enduring contest or whatever. I think what he points out, and I agree with this, in the, 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 what happened in 31, 32 in Manchuria was awful, but neither the government of or the people in Japan or China really regarded themselves as being in full scale war until 1937. Mm. There was a lot of conflict, but not war. War, in terms of full-scale conflict, is, is from 37. So that I would I would qualify it that way. Not that I'm absolving the Japanese of what they did in 31. The other thing is that when you really understand, in my view, what how dysfunctional Japanese leadership is, that leadership was not capable of sitting down in 1931 and working out a program that would go from 31 to 45. I mean, so much of what the Japanese do uh, in 37 and afterwards is just sort of, uh, uh, you know, taking advantage of whatever happens, usually because of what the Germans do. Right. Uh, that's that's what inspires them to, you know, one Japanese writes that, you know, when, when Hitler overruns Western Europe, it's like an opportunity that comes once in a thousand years. That this is, you know, Japan's moment to basically, um, take advantage of the situation not that they've planned this out so uh, you know I, I i thoroughly agree that ignoring what's been going on in obviously in china asia pacific from 37 onward is just is, is just wrong in terms of how we should view the second world war right. um, so uh the whole memorandum uh didn't roosevelt understand that this ultimatum boxed the japanese and war became inevitable was Roosevelt outmaneuvered by Hawks in his administration, like Hull? You know, that's a, that's a that's a point. I, I I was already talking long enough in the presentation. I wanted to get to that. <laughs> and what uh, what you have to do is, like I said, when you really get down, like I said, in the weeds of the diplomatic papers, and one of the things that you realize is the Japanese have these two basic positions that they want us to exceed in, in order to basically eliminate the quagmire in China. And it goes back and forth. And Hall is is reading the stuff, and the Japanese ambassador in Washington, Nomura, is reading things the same way. And he's he's on this one man crusade, in effect, trying to head off war. Mm. And when he's given these negotiating positions, he knows the U.S. will not agree to. 
he and uh, the special ambassador they sent Caruso, uh, they take from some uh, material they've been sent, they pull out terms that basically would be a re restoration of the status quo ante before Japan goes into southern Indochina. And they present that to the Americans as the Japanese position. And then they, when they report it to, to, to Tokyo, they get this you know, rocket back telling them that you know, it's unacceptable. They have to withdraw that and reinsert the proposal that Tokyo had drafted up. And when that happens, uh, Hull, who's been following this, you know, realizes when they submit their new terms, he, he says, you can read it right in the memo of the conversation, he says, well, this is like asking us to abandon uh, Great Britain. You know, he understands that that's what the Japanese are demanding. And then in the intercepts, he reads messages saying that, first of all, the Japanese have an absolute deadline of November 28th uh, for the negotiations to end. And secondly, the U.S. must accede to abandoning China at a minimum thing. And when Hull reads those two me those messages over here and what he's dealt with with Nomura, he realizes at that point, these negotiations effectively are at an end. So that whole note, is really what what he's saying is we want to go out on the highest possible note in the back of his mind and just like with the brits in the back of his mind is is munich right we're not going to submit we're not going to truckle down and so i'm going to issue this note it's not really an ultimatum because you have to give a you have to give a specific time and threaten war that's not what the that's what the note does it does not meet a legal definition of an ultimatum it's it's a convenient argument for the japanese that well they were negotiating on and then the whole note came along and we saw that it was all over well it was the other way around we hall and the administration saw that basically the negotiations you know at that point they become pointless because they wanted us to abandon the chinese right right um it looks like we have about a question maybe one two more um how effective was Japan's economic development program, the East Asia co-prosperity sphere, to lure away Western allied nations such as India, Burma, and others? You know, that's that's a topic I'm going to get into more in the next two volumes or whatever here. Uh, the, the, the problem with any implementation of that is the Japanese are in the middle of this horrendous war. So everything is, you know, what's going to help Japan in, in the war. It's not going to be how to, how to help our Asian brothers and sisters. Uh, and there's a lot of what, what goes on. What, one of the most devastating things about the, uh, the, the war is the disruption of food uh, growing and food distribution. And it, starvation is going to be the principal cause of, of death in the Asia Pacific War. And it all gets back to actions primarily taken by the, by the Japanese. So um, I, I really, I don't have one simple answer to that at this point. I, I'll, I will have so, a lot to say about that in the next two volumes. Mm. Uh, and the last question, uh, why did the Japanese so quickly decide to allow Soviet flag ships to sail into Vladivostok after Pearl Harbor when so many of these vessels were actually newly built Liberty ships with U.S. supplies in the holds? Yeah, well, that's, that's one of the really oddities about the war, right? The Japanese, uh, once they are full tilt into war with the U.S. and the Brits or whatever here, and we're shipping all this stuff across the North Pacific. We, we ship a tremendous amount of lend lease material across the North Pacific, which is an aspect about the war that almost is entirely ignored. I think by, by tonnage, one account said it's like 48% of what we send. The one caveat that we follow is that we don't put obvious things like planes and tanks on the decks of the ship <laughs> to the Soviets across uh, the North Pacific or whatever. That That's down in the holds or it's otherwise being transported to Persian Gulf or something like that. We send a lot of food uh, across the North Pacific. To the, and the Japanese decide that they've got quite enough to do fighting the U.S. and the Brits and the Chinese or whatever here and not getting into a further war uh, with the Soviets. And right to, through 1942, the Japanese are still very optimistic the Germans are eventually going to bail them out by first beating the Soviets and then wheeling and, and knocking out the Brits. And then at that point, they figure we'll, we'll quit because the prospects for carrying on successfully against the Axis powers would be so dim. Well, another great one. And we can't wait for the next book. Um, we look forward to it very much. And as always, uh, thanks very much, Dr. Frank. It's, it's always a pleasure to have you. It's always a pleasure to be with you all. Great. Thank you.